Yeah, so, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, author and friend, Misha Rudny from Bristol, who will speak about on average distance problem and positive characteristics. Please. Uh, I, I must, of course, I thank everyone for giving me the pleasure of speaking at the seminar, despite as I've been complaining, it just somehow, this whole Zoom business, I find it just so stressful. So if I start making fool of, uh, out of myself, which I usually do when I give Zoom talks, uh, then, then it, I guess it's just the symbol of aging. Uh, and then I was thinking about what to talk about. And I've actually, so we've done this work. We're pretty much, yeah, so, so, so I guess we finished this paper, or it was two papers. Mm last year and i've realized so, so there are five of us on this paper at some point of course i'll mention my co-authors uh, but i've never given a talk myself about this paper and uh, i like this paper i think it's i think it's uh, it's uh, kind of interesting so it has some some new old ideas well old ideas in, in a sense i mean some, some old ideas were found and fetched and uh, it's kind of neat so i thought i'll when, when, when Sasha offered me uh, to choose a topic and, and I was thinking, shall I talk about something newer? But then I thought, oh, I'll talk about this one because I've never done this and I, <laughs> I like the subject. So, so this is all about the Erdos distance problem, uh, but I'll talk about the positive characteristics case. So, mm. and, and in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, how knowledgeable the audience is about it, I guess it varies. So if I should be quicker, I can be quicker. If I should, if I should be slower, I can be slower. And ideally, of course, if you, it would be nice if people interrupt me and I ask questions and probably just like this, not, not using chat, because I mean, uh, I'm having this screen in front of me, the iPad and, and, and the pencil and, and the chat, it would be just too much. I, 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 I will not notice it, I guess. So, so I'll just immediately make a small comment, Misha, that uh, there is a bunch of students, like master students here. So uh -huh, I guess uh -huh. uh, some basics, uh, reviewing some basics yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. relatively well, slowly would be nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I certainly am not planning to give people an inferiority complex. And, and so I, if, uh, so if really, if I'm, if I'm too, if I'm assuming too much knowledge, just, just, just slow me down. Okay. And, and on the other hand, if you get bored to say, come on, Misha, I mean, be a man. Uh, right, so so this is this is so there are several sort of versions of the Erdős distance problem, uh, and the first one is what is the minimum number of distinct distances, pairwise distances, that an endpoint set in, in d dimensions generates. So this delta of n would be the quantity, mm. and uh, mm, so Erdős conjectured uh, that. Uh, Delta of n is uh, uh, greater. So the squiggle would five would uh, hide powers of would would five would will, will will hide logarithmic factors of n. So n to the power uh, two over g. Uh, the example, of course, well, of course, the example being uh, a piece of of uh, integer grid. So if we have a piece of integer grid in, in two dimensions, uh, then we have slightly fewer than uh, n dist distinct distances, right? So if we draw a little cartoon. And here are our integers. So we have root n by root n and, uh, and a square of the distance. Uh, so let's say uh, r is going to be the distance, r squared is uh, i squared 
plus j squared. So the square of the distance uh, is uh, the number between, is, is an integer between, uh, say, 0 and 2n. And this integer is a sum of two squares, and the density of such integers is 1 over uh, log, 1 over square root of log n. So, so that's why this. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm always pointing the, on my on my iPad, thinking that everybody sees it. But so so that's why that's why this. So if we take the same example in three dimensions, then we will not have a logarithmic factor anymore. So, but in higher dimensions, this problem is is very wide open. And uh, actually, this problem was solved by Guth and Katz in 2010. So, in d equals two. In 2010, uh, Guth and Katz solved this problem. Well, as far as I'm concerned, this is solved. Uh, some people may argue there is a power of log missing. So they've shown that, that delta of n is uh, greater up to a, is a constant times uh, n divided by log n. And uh, moreover, uh, so this, this estimate for the cardinality of the distance set was obtained from an L2 estimate. And the L2 estimate that gave this estimate was sharp. So the L2 estimate was sharp. Uh, this estimate for the cardinality was obtained in the usual way. Uh, mm, combining L1 and L2 norms. And basically the fact that that, uh, that uh, a square root of, of, of log n was lost, that was kind of in the mercy of cauchy schwarz inequality that was applied. So as far as I'm concerned, in D equals 2, the problem is solved. Then you can ask a little bit more stringent versions of the same question. So how about, so here we're talking about the total number of distinct distances, well, we might actually want to look at the, so given a set of n points, we might look at the maximum number of distances from one point of the set. So it's they call it pinned distance. So, and uh, obviously the number of pinned distances is uh, smaller than the total number of distances. Uh, so is it true that the pinned version of the conjecture Holds. Well, presumably, yes, but the pinned one is already open. And the best known result is, uh, is uh, choosing the color, best It's from the early noughties by Katz and Tardos. And uh, so the pinned one, delta star of n is uh, n to the point eight six, and so on and so forth. So quite close to one, but but not yet one. Uh, and uh, as far as this question is concerned, this is really how mm, this problem has been studied before the Guth and Katz breakthrough result. And uh, whenever people spoke about, whenever people studied this area resistance problem, they actually ended up estimated the pinned one. And there, there is a long history of estimating the pinned uh, distance. So uh, Erdos himself, so I'll just give the exponents. So Erdos himself said, uh, well, I'll say here, bigger uh, than n to the one half, the number of pinned distances. And then it was, uh, uh, that was in the 40s. Then Moza in the 60s and to the two thirds. And uh, then at some point in the early 80s, the Semiradi Trotter theorem kicked in. So Semiradi Trotter and Chung, Chung Semiradi Trotter, mm, that was uh, and to the three quarters. And then Elikesh 
so from from now from this on people started using simulated rotor theorem and not just simulated rotor theorem for lines and points uh and shall i assume that everyone knows the simulated rotor theorem well, that, yeah i think that's fine in my opinion can i can, can i quick clarification so these results that you are stating uh, this is for dimension d equals to two yeah d equals two yeah yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so th let me let me say that in d equals three and higher everything is wide open and and in d equals three this is particularly interesting so i really want to live to see the solution of of of, of this one d in d equals three but i don't know how, how long I, I, I will have to live for that so sometimes i think i, I will but it depends on the blood pressure and other issues okay so uh Thanks, Joshua. So, yeah, if you want, if you feel like, I mean, interrupt me whenever you feel like. So, so then Elikesh, I think, uh, so, so from then on, people started using simulated trotter theorem, and actually simulated trotter theorem, not just for lines, but for, for circles. So, and, uh, and uh, then Elikesh, uh, combining perhaps the version for circles, I mean, basically the, the crossing uh, number lemma in various guises, with the actual simulated rotor theorem trying to use it several times. So Elikesh succeeded in, in using simulated rotor theorem twice. And, and he used it twice and he got the better result and to the uh, four fifth. And then Shoy Moshe and, uh, and, to and, 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 and uh, Toth, uh, they, so, so Shoy Moshe and Toth, uh, they gave uh, six seventh. And, and then there was some work on improving these six sevenths, actually, which had another very nice idea. I think the idea came from Tardos originally, or maybe, 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 maybe uh, Janos, maybe Pach and, uh, and Tardos. Uh, so there was, there was some elaborations on these six sevenths. And, uh, and, the, and the six sevenths is almost 0.86, it's a little bit smaller. And then, so there were, there were, there were, there was, there were several papers in between and these six, six sevenths were, were made 0.86 something. So there was some iterative construction. So this, this is whatever, this is one of the world fundamental constants, I guess, uh, irrational. Uh, and ever since then, there has been no progress on the single distance uh, problem despite the resolution of, of this one by Guth and Katz. Uh, okay, and there is the third version, which is, so, I mean, this one obviously implies that one. There is a third version which stands apart because I don't think this one implies this one. Uh, so there's a third version, and this is just to give the supremum on the, on the, number, the maximum number of occurrences of your favorite distance in an endpoint set in, in, in RD. And uh, again, this one is really, really wide open. So in D equals two, all we know is, uh, so let's say, let's use the repetition. So R, the repetition number of, uh, of uh, N, the repetition number of, uh, of a distance for a set of N point is bounded by N to the four thirds. And this is just one application of simulated rotor theorem for for points and 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 circles of the same radius. So in in, in two dimensions in in the Euclidean plane, the simulated rotor theorem apply works not just for straight lines, but for for any for kind of pseudo lines. I mean anything that that looks like straight lines in the set in the sense that two points determine. Only, there is only a finite number of these pseudo lines that can pass through two points. So this is the main thing. And unit circles are to satisfy this. So this bound comes from one single application of simulated rotor theorem. And so far, we don't know any improvements of this bound even, even by an epsilon. So this is wide open. Uh, in this talk, yeah, so let me go to my... Next slide. Yes. So there is one. There is one more thing I want to mention. This is another reformulation. So there is also a, a Faulkner, so-called Faulkner problem. So the Faulkner problem just reverses the questions. 
for instance, I mean, let's look at this one. This one says, what is the maximum, meaning the minimum number of distances uh, given by a set of endpoints? So I can reverse the question, right? So I can say, what is the minimum number of points to guarantee that I have delta distances? And uh, uh, obviously, obviously we can reverse the dependence. So the conjecture would be that, uh, uh, that uh, n, the minimum number of points, has to be anything greater than the squill of, of delta to the power d over two. Uh, and this question arose actually in the continuous setting and whenever people talk about the Falconer problem or Falconer conjecture, they take they talk about the continuous setting. So, so basically what they ask is, uh, what is the infimum dimension of, uh, of, of a set, a Hausdorff dimension or any, your favorite dimension really. Uh, what is the infimum dimension of a set in D dimensions in RD to yield the distance set, which is kind of conspicuous. Conspicuous, for instance, the distance set that has positively big measure. Or a little bit weaker, the distance set which has dimension one. So distances, of course, are scalar, so they're one dimensional. So what is the, the minimum the infimum dimension that uh, gives a noticeable uh, different set. And this is a conjecture. This is a conjecture. And uh, the conjecture is that this critical dimension, let's just call it Tim star, is uh, bigger than D over two, the same D over two. And it's wide open. So the best results are what is known Uh, uh, was uh, dim star is bigger than uh, four thirds in D equals two. That was proved by Wolf, Tom Wolf, in uh, the in nineteen in the in the late nineties. Does Tom Wolf have two Fs? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. So the late 90s. And then Erdogan uh, uh, actually proved kind of the same numerology for all D, so bigger than D over 2 plus 1 third for all mm -hmm. D. That was Erdogan in the early notice. And then it stayed like this for, for, for quite a while. But recently, Guth and Guth and uh, Guth and uh, Guth, Yosevich, Orr and Wang, uh, so I'd say Guth and company, Guth at all, they proved uh, that Dim Star is bigger than uh, five quarters in D over two, which was kind of, I guess, uh, well, at least the paper is, is quite yeah. interesting. Yep. You mean something else because four thirds is bigger than five quarters, right? No, we want the infimum dimension, right? So we want to, we want, we want, we want, we want to bring it down to one. Uh, so, yeah. so, so now we, we, we take the, we take the question upside down. So we want, ah, so you, then the, 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 the inequality should be reworked. It's reversed. minimum, minimum. It, it should be smaller. Ah, ah. ah, yeah. Oh yes. So yeah, so I say equal. Yes. Equal. Then we don't, then the, I mean, equality is so much better, right? Because, because yes. So this infimum dimension, let's call it. Yes. Oh yes. Super. Uh, this infimum dimension. It's le so let's so so the notation is dim star, and then it's just everything is equal. No, but then then there it should be less than or equal for. Yeah. Certain, oh, so. Okay. 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 But we know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. You're. Yes. Yes. Uh, Andre, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's. I, I've. I don't, I, I've always had problems with quantifiers and inequalities. 
So, and that was kind of a breakthrough. I, well, at least the paper made it into in the so it's very difficult to read. And it uses decoupling. So, then in, in the notes, kind of people started dabbling with finite fields and finite fields became fashionable. So, of course, you can ask the same questions uh, about finite fields. So, uh, you can just replace the reals by your favorite finite field F uh, and uh, ask the same questions. So, in particular, I mean, so FP, of course, is going to be the prime residue field and FQ is, is a finite field which has P to some power elements. And uh, you can ask the same questions. However, of course, when you ask these questions, the sets that, so there are kind of two types of questions that you can ask. So the first type of questions is you want to really speak about mm, sets which are sufficiently small. So, of course, if you take all the points in the plane over a finite field, they're going to give you all the distances. There is no question about that. So when I say that the sets are sufficiently small in terms of P and Q, I would just say, quote, I mean, I would just mean that these sets are really quite small. So, for instance, uh, if I speak about the plane over FP, I would think about point sets which are which have no more than p points so basically i want estimates uh, so so when i when i say sufficiently small in term, uh, in terms of p and q i will I, I want estimates on on the number of distances which will not contain p or q explicitly and these estimates may only hold for sets sufficiently small and then there is another side of the coin and this is the falconer type question and the Falconer type question is type question would be what is the minimum number of points uh, and let's let's say let's ask this question only in, in I mean we can ask this question in FQ but yes we can ask it in FP the way I've written down is is in in, in FP so what is the minimum cardinality of a point set to make sure to to ensure that the number of distinct distances gives you is comparable with p, say p over two, or asymptotically goes to p. Michel, when you write uh, f p f q, uh, what, uh, what do you mean, like uh, primes and prime powers, or do you? Yeah, mean... so these are, so yeah, p is a prime, q is a prime power. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So so, and then people started dabbling or doing these questions, and. Uh, Mm. So, uh, the first non-trivial result was obtained by Guthkas and Tau. Uh, so, so, basically, the Erdos... Erdos delta of n uh, bigger than square root of n applies in, in D equals two, so in uh, D equals two applies unconditionally. Well, let me just put, there's a one half just in case. It applies unconditionally. And then in 2003, Bourguin, Katz, and Tau proved that, well, let's say again, for sufficiently small sets, so for, for n sufficiently far from, uh, from uh, 2, uh, uh, well, let's say 2 might, uh, oh, sorry, from n sufficiently far from the whole plane, p like two minus delta, uh, delta of n is greater than n to the power one half plus epsilon, which might depend on delta. Uh, except there is one silly example, except uh, when uh, all uh, all points, or the only or 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 the the only distance 
is zero. So what happens is that that uh, if uh, if you live in FP and uh, if minus one is a square, then you can have isotropic lines. So basically, let's say if if I, which is square root of minus one, is in F. So when I say F, it's basically the field I'm dealing with, whether it's FP, FQ, or whatever field I'm dealing with. So if I is there, then directions 1 plus minus I are, are isotropic. So, which means that if I, all points on this, on an isotropic line have distance zero from one another. Yeah, when I speak about a distance between, uh, actually, when I speak about a distance, uh, in this case, I don't take the square root, right? So, uh, the distance between two points, uh, uh, P1 and P2, Two, uh, no, I don't want p's because p's is going to be the characteristic. So the distance between the point mm, x one comma y one and the point x two comma y two, when I speak about positive characteristic, is going to be mm, x two minus x one squared plus. Uh, y2 minus y1 squared. So I, I'm not going to be taking the square root. And also I'll use this notation. So when I use this for distance, I actually, I, I, I don't take the square root. Okay, so now let me just uh, come to the main results. Mm. I had an ambitious plan. I might also tell you something about three dimensions, but with my with but let's see how it goes. Maybe yes, maybe no. So let me talk about two dimensions so far. So that was kind of a long work which started as uh, my paper with uh, Brendan Murphy and uh, with Brendan Murphy and Sophie Stevens, uh, and uh, then we had another version and uh, we got new, two new co-authors, Georgis Petritis and, and, uh, and Tang Pham. So, but now it's a paper of five authors and these are two main theorems in the paper. So two main results and uh, here they are. So if, uh, uh, If, uh, so if I have any, any field of characteristic P, it doesn't have to be a finite field. So for any field of characteristic P, if N is uh, less than P to the four thirds, then the number of distinct P distances is uh, at least N to the two thirds. So this is the same exponent as Moser obtained about the reals in, uh, in the 60s. Uh, we cannot do anything better than that because we don't have a full strength simulated Schroeder theorem uh, in finite fields. And moreover, we don't have at all any reasonable incidence theorem for circles. So we only have something for lines, not for circles. And uh, the other, the other uh, claim is the Falconer type claim. And then it says that if, if f equals to, if f is fp and the number of points is bigger than four fifths, then, uh, then we have the Falconer time claim, time claim that, that the number of uh, distinct pin distances is, well, p over two or something like this. And we're quite happy that our five quarters uh, matched uh, the five quarters over here in terms of the, uh, 
new result by Gotham Company, uh, which used such fancy and profound things as decoupling, and uh, our result certainly doesn't use things this doesn't use things of this complexity or depth or whatever whatever you, whatever you, you call them. Let me make just a remark here that uh, in terms of remarks about the second issue. Misha, just a quick question. So, uh, yeah, sure. I missed it. So, this uh, in the first part, P is a prime, and does it matter in the second part also of the theorem? Yeah. So, in the first part, F is whatever field of whatever field of positive characteristic. Ah, okay, okay, whatever. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. And in the second one, is specific uh, specific to F P, and so, so this is. Oh, okay. But uh, if the first part does it have to? Uh, so P there is. Uh, is a prime still or uh, not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in... characteristic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so P. Let's P. Let's let's P, P. Let's reserve P for the prime. So if okay. I want a point, I will use a Q for a point or something else. Okay. Okay. So so one remark is that if F equals F Q, so and Q is not a prime, so then. Uh, it has been known since the mid since uh, about, since the, since about the 2012 or something. There was a, a there's there are several results by Yosevich and collaborators. So n bigger than q to the four thirds. And again, this is the same four thirds as 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 Wolf had for for the Falconer problem, so implied delta star of n greater than q. So this is quite an easy result. Uh, so there's it uses some kind of baby Fourier analysis over finite fields, uh, and uh, and the fact that if you Mm, so, so this is all. This is all about this. All this is all in two dimensions. So, yeah. So I'm speaking for, from now on. I'm speaking about two dimensions only. Uh, and uh, and essentially, what it used, uh, what it uses is is the circle is well almost a Salem set. So when you add points on the circle to itself, you have at most two repetitions or something like that. So that's that's a, that's, a, that's an easy result, uh, but uh, it's it's a nice proof. It's a nice result. So it was done in 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 the begin is in about two thousand twelve, I think, or maybe a little bit earlier, and and there were several iterations of this result. But but by now you can really prove this on on, on a page. Hmm. So and and what's what what what's what's what I find very interesting that. That quite recently, maybe three years ago, so Brendan Murphy and Jorgis Petridis, they can they actually showed that that in FQ this cannot be improved. So Murphy and Petridis. This is best possible. In F Q Q is not P. I I, I think they used I, I think they used Q, Q equals P cubed or something like this, and then they came up. So so they basically they use they use subspaces in uh, in uh, in uh, finite fields, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a very nice paper and a very nice result. So we managed to do better than that in FP, and hopefully in FP we can really expect that the true answer, the true exponent is really one, but of course we're very far from that, from proving this. So that's that's the main result, and now I'm going to be talking about the technology, about about the proof, I mean the, the, some, the sketch of proof of this result. Any, any questions are very welcome by now. Have we lost many participants already? 
Yeah, I think I would be happy if you yes, say a bit more about like this best possible because there are several parameters here and it would be nice to understand which in which sense. So here you mean that uh, yeah. this Murphy so, so what, what I mean by what I mean what I mean by that is that is uh, uh, is uh, so they constructed a smaller, uh, like set slightly smaller than this Q to the four thirds that has much fewer distances. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's it's, it's yes, you, yes, you're right uh, yeah. by asking this. So this is this claim, this claim, this claim is a little bit obscure. So, so let us just let us just let us say one half Q. Let us just say that we want one half Q here. Uh, and and wh why why should it and also why should it be Q? Uh, do you do you like? Uh, is it interesting to look at? So is it like in parallel with this uh, continuous version kind of? Yeah, it's in parallel with the continuous version. Yes, because you may ask for like when do you have like I don't know Q to two thirds uh, distances. Uh, it and, seems that yeah, it seems that uh, so so this is some kind of threshold. In some sense, that so if you if you want to ask if Q to the, so so I mean I I I won't be I'm I'm not sure about uh, F Q but in F P this is definitely a threshold in a sense that in a sense that if you're asking about about say P to the power one minus epsilon distances this is essentially the same question as this question. Mm -hmm. So 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 there is kind of a, a, a sub a separation. Uh, two types of question. One one type of question about small sets, and then you want things where the, you want estimates which are independent of the characteristic or of the size of the field. And then there is something about big sets. So how about so what's the so so in a sense in a sense yes. So this is this is so so the questions about big sets is is what are the smallest sets that that sort of uh, that that act as if you are dealing with with pretty much the whole space. Mm -hmm. So you see what I mean? Like, like if you take, of course, the whole space, uh, then then uh, over. If you take the whole plane over FP, then the number of distances would be still p. And then you want to ask, so what's the minimum size? What's the minimum size of the set, which is going to give me, well, if not p, let's say p over two distinct distances. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. maybe when, so here you are really talking about distant distances, but what uh, the analogies of the questions of pin distances and so on does it imply anything about them? Uh, so here I'm talking about pin, but but uh, okay. in a sense, so so, so mm, no 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 differences have been spotted. So basically, all the methods that that work for just distance work for pin and the other way around. Thank you. So, so, so yes. Yeah, so Murphy and Petridis basically said said that said that uh, you can uh, have uh, examples uh, in F Q so that uh, that you um, so 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 that you never get so so you you get you you have you have examples in F Q. When uh, when uh, uh, when what when uh, I set this q to the four thirds minus one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, you yeah, get yeah. significantly smaller than q. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Little law of q, no? Yeah, little of q, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so but. Now let's talk about the the proof. So, what are we going to do? So, so the first thing, I mean, how do we start a, a proof of Ethereum? Of course, we're going to start with Cauchy-Schwarz, or we're going to end with Cauchy-Schwarz. Uh, uh, so, so let's look at instead of looking at at pinned distances, let's look at the number of isosceles triangles. So, uh, this is the definition, right? So, so isosceles triangles. We look at triples of, of points A, B, and C in our set so that the different the distance between A and B equals the distance of A and C. 
And there is a slight annoyance coming from uh, coming from these isotropic lines, uh, which I won't mention all the time. So, so I need this extra condition that that uh, that uh, the distance between B and C itself is not zero. So basically, the reason I want something like this is that I want to have my Euclidean pictures. I want my Euclidean pictures to work. And uh, if this is uh, my B and this is my C and this is my A, so that's an isosceles triangle, and then there's a bisector, which is perpendicular to this line. So if uh, the line connecting B and C is isotropic, it's perpendicular to itself. So if, if, uh, if uh, this line is isotropic, then A also lines on this line. And I'm counting basically degenerate triangles. So triangles, all three points of which are collinear, and I, I don't want to do this. And moreover, moreover, actually, if a, and if a line is, is isotropic, the concept of a symmetry relative to this line just doesn't make sense. Because again, because the line is self perpendicular. So that's, that's why this condition is necessary. But this, I mean, there are not too many of these, uh, of these isotropic ones, just because there are only two isotropic lines through each point. So that's, 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 not, that's not many enough. And uh, so if I manage to bound this one from above, then I would, uh, by Cauchy-Schwartz, the number of pin distances is is the total number of choices of A, B, and C divided by 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 um, by sort of by the number of times this equivalence relation is satisfied. So the number of distinct distances becomes n cubed over this t. So basically, our problem becomes by bound, bounding this t from from uh, above. And so instead of these two claims, we'll prove these two claims that. T is smaller than n to the seven thirds, provided that n is less than p to the four thirds. And then when t is, uh, uh, and then when n is bigger than p to the five quarters, then this t of a is kind of, is, um, is statistical, is as it should be, n cubed be divided by p. Uh-huh. Okay, so the next thing is to introduce a concept that uh, that was first introduced by in a series of work again by Jorgis Petridis, Ben Lund, Adam Schaeffer. Uh, oh, I forgot to, I forgot Frank Dezeo. So I think the first paper was using this quantity was in. Uh, 2016. So let's see. So let us just write this this uh, number of. So we're doing mm, we're doing isosceles triangles, and what we're going to do we we'll just write the number of isosceles triangles as uh, yeah we'll take lines, and a vertex A is going to lie on the line, and the points B and C are going to be symmetric relative to this line. So, in other words, this is the sum over all lines and, uh, whoops, the lines, I'll, I'll refer to them as bisectors, and uh, n1 is the number of points on a line, and n2 is the number of points of pairs, I mean, pairs of points symmetric relative to this line. So this is, on this picture, this is n1 and this is n2. And wherever we take something from here, we have a nice also this triangle. Of course, again, Cauchy-Schwartz. So we separated by Cauchy-Schwartz and uh, the sum of a line of n1 squared is just the sum of pairs of points in our set. So this is, this quantity is just, this quantity is just n. And what is the other one? The other one is called the bisector energy. So the bisector energy. So what is the meaning? What is the meaning of this term? Uh, so we're taking this. We're taking n two squared. So basically, we're taking. We're considering all pairs 
of segments symmetric well this intersection should happen on the line we're looking at all pairs of, of segments symmetric with respect to this line so this quantity b the bisector energy is uh, the number of segments with vertices in our set which are axial symmetric which is symmetric relative to some line so we have two so we have one segment and we have another segment in our set and they're symmetric relative to some line so we count all these this is this quantity by sector energy of course when we count this of course if they're symmetric relative to some some line they have, must have the same length right so that's why there's a natural uh, partitioning by lengths so that this bisector energy is mm, the sum of of uh, by by lengths and notice that basically if we have two segments of the same length in space most likely they're not going to be symmetric right actually symmetric because the space of uh, the space of segments of say length one is three dimensional so it's three dimensional because we're free to i mean the, the, the whole space of segments of length one in the plane. So, because, I mean, we're free to choose, uh, we have two dimensions for the choice, for the choice of one point and one dimension for the choice of the other point. So the, say, this, uh, the space of segments of length one or any, length, any fixed length is three dimensional. On the other hand, the space uh, given a segment of length one, uh, the space of those symmetric to it relative to some line is the same has the same dimension as the space of lines and the space of lines is two dimensional so uh, basically uh, pairs pairs of segments of the same length which are symmetric relative to some axis are kind of thin in the set of pairs of segments of the same length And the next concept is the concept of uh, Blaschke Grunewald kinematic mapping. So that was, let me just turn the light on just a sec. Misha, one question. Uh, yeah. like, uh, so this, this formula, this bound on uh, T of A that you wrote, uh, am, are we supposed to understand why do we get this inequality or why like, would that or, or, or is it, it, does it require some manipulations that you, you want to avoid kind of? Andrea, which, which bound? This uh, sum of, uh, yeah, 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 this, this line, like why, why is it an inequality? Because, uh, oh, this, you mean this one? Why this is bigger than what you wrote before? Why this is bigger? Why this is bigger than that? No, uh, yeah. Well, the, the the reason for the inequality that you write, I'm I'm not quite seeing it. Maybe ah, but that's Cauchy Schwartz, okay. right? Just okay. So that's no. The, okay. Yeah. 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 That's Cauchy Schwartz. Ah, it's not minus. It's uh, ah, it's uh, a squiggle. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. I was, I was confused. Okay, ah, okay. Okay. Let's make this. Let's remove the con 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 confusion. That's, okay, 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 okay. That's the squiggle. I, I was trying to figure. Okay, good. No, no, no. I'm not doing anything difficult. Okay. Okay. So, so there is this concept of Blaschke Grunewald kinematic mapping, uh, which. I have rediscovered, <laughs> and this, so the, so Blaschke and Greenwald wrote in papers about it independently in, uh, in, uh, two th in, in, in uh, 1908, and coincidentally, exactly 100 years later, this Blaschke Greenwald kinematic mapping was rediscovered uh, by Elikesh and Shahir, and uh, then used by Guth and Gass in their proof of, of uh, the Erdős distance conjecture. And uh, so in uh, the literature about distances in modern literature, this blaschke grunewald kinematic mapping is usually being mentioned as, as uh, elikesh Scherer paradigm. But essentially that's, that's, well, not essentially, this is the same thing. So if you go back to these old papers, then they're asking exactly the same questions. Uh, 
So, okay, so, so let me describe a little bit. So I'm going to be talking about, so F bar is, 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 is an algebraically closed field. So at some point, so, so basically, I will need to be able to take square, to, to, to take square roots. And that's why I need, to, I need to enlarge my field a little bit, but that won't be a problem for, for the results. Mm. So, so let's see. So uh, first of all, let's look at the space of the segments of, of the same length R. And uh, then I can identify this uh, space with a group of rigid motions. Uh, so what I mean by this is that, I mean, in order to get a segment of uh, in order to get a segment of length, say one, I will take my favorite segment, say between uh, the origin and the point uh, one zero and move it uh, to this one by a rigid motion. And there is only one way of doing this. So I will need to translate it and then rotate it by, by the correct angle. So uh, basically the set of segments of the same length is the same as, as, as the group of rigid motions. And a rigid motion is a composition of a translation and a rotation. And this is, this is we can write it as a matrix. So these, so U, V, R are cosine and sine. But since I'm working with an abstract field, I'm not writing cosine and sine, I'm just writing U and V. And, co and this is the relation between U and V that they are, they are on the union circle. And S and, and T are just two components of the translation. So that's my reason. Okay. And uh, mm, the Blanche Grunewald mapping is really uh, uh, the half angle formula. So the Blanche Grunewald mapping says that, so it's called the kinematic mapping, and it says that, that, uh, that, the, that this group nicely injects into the three dimensional projective space. And it injects by way of uh, by way of uh, the half angle formula. So we take this um, G, and so U. Uh, so, so we write basically U equals U tilde squared minus V tilde squared, and we think of U tilde squared as the cosine of the half angle, and V tilde as the sine of the half angle. So V, of course, the sine is two U tilde V tilde. And then if we, and, and then we can just describe this rigid motion very nicely in terms of, in terms of the half angle. And this is, this is the description. And this point is, is a point in the projective space. So what it means is that if we divide by U, we'll divide by the cos, by, by two U, we'll divide by the cosine of the half angle. It's gonna be one. So from the projective space, we move to three dimensions. And that's going to be the tangent of the half angle. And this is just how, 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 how the tangent of the half angle will appear in the, I mean, in the translation. And this map is invertible, of course. Uh, uh, I mean, invertible like, like this. And uh, there is the only glitch is the denominator. The denominator can be zero. So, uh, especially if minus one is not the square, so so that's why I'm saying that that it's so that it's it's an injection really. So I mean uh, that this group is not the whole space, uh, not not the whole projective space from the projective space. I might, I should throw out a little bit where these denominators are zero, but that's that's not important. And as a matter of fact, if I instead of if, if instead of this group I take uh, I take SO three then actually there are going to be no zero denominators, then it's going to be just, just, the, just an isomorphism. So this is, this is the kinematic mapping. And uh, now I have, I, I, so, so, so the kinematic mapping is really a way of, of straightening things. So the, this, this, the idea of Guthkatz when they proved the Erdős distance conjecture, well, not the idea of Guthkatz, actually that was the idea of Erdős distance conjecture, was to kind of to, rather than, speaking about distances, which is all about points and circles in the plane, they translate, they, they sort of, they reinterpreted this problem as a problem about intersections of lines in three dimensions. And uh, this Grunewald-Blaschke mapping 
it's it's really what it's doing. It's kind of so it's rather than using so so it replaces so basically it introduces a new variable which is the tangent half of the angle which is which is kind of which is which lives on the line. Uh, and here is a natural question now. So what 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 we want to understand? So what we said is so we want to get this bisector energy. Bisector energy is a, is a, is is we're counting pairs of of segments symmetric with respect to with respect to some line. And now here is a question. So I have I have one segment. I, have, I fix my so I have my, my segment of length r. This segment is represented by a point in the three in the three dimensional projective space. And now let me look at the set of all other segments. So I fix this one. Let me look at the set of all other segments in the three dimensional projective space, which are symmetric. Uh, let me look at yeah. So so let me look at all segments in my physical space, which are symmetric to this one relative to some bisector, relative to some line. What do they? What do their images? What do their kinematic mapping images look like in the in the projective space? That's that's basically my question. And then I start thinking about it, and 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 sort of the general paradigm is that this map is so nice it makes everything flat. Uh, and on top of this, so I have my, 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 my favorite segment. Uh, so its image in this, by this mapping is a point in the three dimensional projective space. And then somehow all the, other, all the other segments that are symmetric to it. So I have one symmetric, I have one, one symmetric image relative to every line. But what is the set of lines in the, uh, what, what is the set of lines in the plane? They're a projective plane. So the natural intuition is that, that this set, the set of uh, S prime, such that this S and S prime are actually symmetric, should be a plane in FP3, and it is. So, and that is really, that is really the whole thing, which casts it, which, 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 which straightens everything up. So, an easy calculation, which, I, which, which I'm not gonna give, but it's, it's really a, a dumb easy calculation, that answer, it is a plane. And so calculating this bisector energy term, calculating this bisector energy term, there it is, uh, just, the, just the pairs of, of, uh, of actually symmetric segments, is an incidence question in three dimensions between points and planes. And that's the only thing I can do. So BR, BR is the piece of the bisector energy. So now I'm looking at segments of the same length R. If they're symmetric relative to some axis, they must have the same length. So I partition B like this. And a single BR becomes exactly the number of incidences between SR points. So SR is the number of segments of length R given by my set. And the same number of plane in, in the three dimensional projective space. And here is a general point plane theorem, which says that the number of incidences between M points and M planes in any projective space. And if my if if my field if the underlying field has positive characteristic, then the only constraint is that M has to be smaller than P squared. And there is one more constraint, and at most k are collinear, is this. So I can use this theorem and get a nice estimate for, for the quantity I'm looking at. And this is this is this pretty much this is pretty much it. So the rest is the rest is just a few detail. So what are a few detail? Uh, First of all, I need to satisfy this constraint. Uh, and in order to satisfy this, uh, in order to satisfy this, so M, M, the number of points and planes I'm looking at is the number of segments of the same length. And I can just use the Erdos argument, which is very, very uh, robust. Which, which, which is just basically Cauchy Schwartz, which says that the number of, uh, the number of uh, segments of the same length is bounded by n to the three halves, say times two to three to the three to, to n to the three halves of two to, 
twice into the three halves or something like this. This is just a Cauchy-Schwartz argument. So I'm looking at n circles of the same radius and n points. So, and I'm looking at the incidences and uh, I'm just using Cauchy-Schwartz. So what, 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 what do I mean by this? So rho is a point. So I'm just looking at the sum over points from one through n and C is a circle, uh, the sum over circles from one through n. Delta rho C is when a point sits on the circle. I'm using Cauchy-Schwartz. So I'm using Cauchy-Schwartz relative to this sum. And uh, so the square root of n, uh, of course, and now there's the square root and now I have, I, I, I square this one. And so now I have the sum over pairs of circles. Uh, and now rho is my point. And so when the point rho sits on the pair of circles, well, a pair of circles intersects on at two, uh, two points, or at most at two points. So I can forget about this one. And uh, that's, 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 that, that's how I just, that's how this complaint, that's, that, this is how this constraint is, is, uh, satisfied and this is why this is why in the formulation of the theorem i have this so this is to satisfy the constraint uh to be able to apply the point plane theorem the other thing is to understand what what this what this animal means so um, i'm taking my segments and mapping them into points in the projective space and what is the physical picture that underlies these points in the projective space being collinear? And again, I mean, that's, that's not much of a challenge. You just sit down and, and, uh, and do the calculations. And this is what it, have, what, 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 what it is. So a bunch of segments of the same length Give me, a set, give me a bunch of collinear points in three space under this blaschke grunewald mapping if these points, if these segments uh, lie within the same annulus between two circles and they all have the same length. And notice, well, I mean, the other option is when circles have infinite radii, so then they're between two lines. And notice that none of them are actually symmetric with respect to each other. Another nice, another interesting observation here that if I look at uh, the center of these two annuli and uh, I draw a radius and then I flip this one over here. Then the green one is going to be symmetric with respect to relative, he's going to, going to be actually symmetric to all the pink ones. But Anyhow, anyhow, now I understand, now I understand that, that this K is just the maximum number of collinear, uh, well, co so let me say co-circular, I mean, line being a circle of in infinite radius of co-circular, co points in my original set here. Okay, so now I'm pretty much done. Uh, I just need to make sure that this term, so I want to be able to throw away this term. Let's see if I can, let's see, first of all, let's, let's see what happens if we can throw away this term. So suppose we just have this. So if we just have this, so if we can apply the point plane theorem and just use the main term in it, so what are we going to have? We're going to have that the bisector energy So this is n, and this is the square root of the bisector energy, and the bisector energy is the sum of these, and each one of these is just sr to the three halves. So there we are, sr to the three halves. Well, I guess we've only applied Cauchy cross twice, so let's do it one. Let's do one more time. Mm, so this is going to be. Oops. 
I didn't want that. So we apply Cauchy-Schwarz. We've split these these three halves, and where's one half plus one? So this quantity. What is the sum of all S R over R? This is the total number of pairs of points. So this is n squared. And now this is the sum of SR squared. So what is the sum of SR squared? What is the sum of SR squared? Sum over R. This is the number of pairs of congruent segments. In other words, so the sum over R, S R squared, equals the number of solutions of uh, A minus B equals C minus D over the set A. Well, not zero. Uh, Yes, but another Cauchy Schwartz would say that this is less than or equal than uh, n times uh, the number of solutions times the number of solutions of uh, a minus b equals a minus c. So that's another Cauchy Schwartz. And uh, therefore, therefore, this term is bounded by n times t. And so t is here and t is there, and all that's left is expressing it and getting getting the answer. So by now we've established this claim. And now there is a Falconer claim. And let's 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 just stare if if let's just stare for a sec. So um, let us see. So this says that that if F is F P and N. Misha, I think you haven't finished. Uh, have you finished this? Uh, what What do you do with the second part of the bound in case there are too many uh, co-circulars? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I, I, I had it. So yes, exactly. So if there are too many co-circular, I just use this a stupid greasy pruning. So so. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. If I look back at these two terms, if I look back at these two terms, it turns out that my threshold value for k is uh, n to the two thirds. Uh, is n to the two thirds. So if I'm looking at circles which are very rich, whose number is n, to, I mean the number of points on which is n to the two thirds, then again by by greedy algorithm, the number of such, since, on, since two circles intersect at most two points, the number of such circles is not bigger than n to the one-third. Well, not bigger than two times n to the one-third. And uh, when I look at the tri when I look at isosceles triangle, it's very easy to prove by, by just elementary, just elementary school, school geometric argument, so that if my set A is the disjoint union of B and C, where C lies on a circle or, or a line, then the number of isosceles triangles that arise satisfies this inequality. So, in other words, the contribution of, of the C or the contribution of a single, the, the contribution of a single um, of a single circle or line to the total number of, of, of isosceles triangle is at most a times a times times n squared. And that does the, oops, oh, what happened? Ah, I see what happened, yes. It's just 
Sorry, just a sec. I'll get, I'll get, I'll get the screen back. Yeah. So, so it turns out that the exponents work in exactly the right way. I can prune away. I can prune away these circles, which are two uh, circles or lines which are too rich. So those that have more than n to the two thirds points, and the contribution from all these I'm going to get is exactly is exactly to to how much I can afford. Does that make sense? Um. Yeah, I think it does it to me at least. <laughs> so, so once again, so so we had so th there were two terms. There were two terms here, and if I look at things carefully, I say that that if k is less than the total number, that n to the that n to the two thirds, I'm fine. I can disregard this term. Uh, and uh, suppose this is not true. So let me look at all very rich circles at circles that have at most so these are super rich circles circles that have at most at, at least n to the two thirds points the number of such circles because two circles intersect only at one point so their number is say smaller than n to the two times n to the one third and now uh, if i just look a little bit more carefully how many isosceles triangles all together this circle can give me, then, I mean, so that at least one vertex, oh, fuck, sorry. It's uh, now, again, you're losing the screen, I think. Nope. So that each of the each each of these uh, each of these super H circles can contribute only this number to the isosceles triangles. So an n to the one third of these circles will contribute exactly again n to the seven thirds. So all the exponents just work out uh, as 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 by the apothecary. And uh, that is the end of the proof. So. The other part, Faulkner, it's much shorter. So let's look at let's look at the two. Let's look at just this claims. So uh, so this claim says that if n is bigger than p to the five quarters, then the number of distances is uh, is bigger than p. Okay. So what does this one say? This one say that this one applies when n is less than p to the four thirds. So in particular, it applies when n equals p to the five quarters. If n equals p to the five quarters, n equals p to the five quarters. This one says delta is bigger uh, than n to the uh, five quarters to two uh, five quarters to two thirds, right? Five quarters to two thirds would be so would be smaller. Uh, would delta be p ten twelfths? Ten twelfths is less than one. So there has to be something in between. There has to be something something some glue between these two cases. So this this claim alone is not enough to to prove this. However, uh, if n is p to the five quarters, we are already we are already finding ourselves on the large set on the on the on the large set territory, and there are lots of easy linear algebra results known about large sets, and in particular the one that that we used is a very basic one, and this is a theorem by which well which. I guess the first time was formulated by Vin, but probably it had been known even before that. And 
didn't I give the statement? I, sh I should have given the statement of the theorem. Uh, right, well, wait a sec. Uh, right, so I should give the statement of the theorem. So, then theorem. Uh, the number of incidences between uh, uh, points at P capital and line set L in F Q two. So the field has to be finite, is bounded by the statistical term, which is the number of points times the number of lines divided by Q. It just says that a random point finds itself on a given line with probability of one over Q, plus the error term, which is the square root of uh, Q P. This is a very easy theorem. Again, because, because this theorem is good only when P and L are big, when they're, when they're comparable to, uh, so, so this, 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 bit, this bit of the estimate has Q in the, well, has, has Q. So, so this, uh, when, point, when, P and, when, 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 when P and L are small sets, it's completely useless because of the square root of Q over here. And uh, yeah, so if these things are much smaller than, than that, if these two are say Q to the epsilon, then this, this term is super wasteful. But this theorem is good when P and L are big enough when they are, when they are bigger than Q. And uh, there is also a, 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 a weighted version and the proof is the same, and the weighted version is that if, say, say, lines have, so the functional version, have weights W over L, then the, esti the estimate changes to P, so, and that means that and that means that uh, if we have an incidence, if we have an incidence of a line L with weight W and a point on it, we count this incidence W times. So then the estimate changes to, not unexpectedly, to this is, mm, mm, The L1 norm, so the sum of all weights of all lines. Plus uh, the square root of P, P times uh, L2 norm of the weights. So, which is just the sum over lines of W of L squared by one half. So, and this theorem becomes... Do, do, do you have the same uh, statement uh, when you weigh the points also? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, of course, yeah, you can weigh the points. As, uh, and yes, so there's going to be one norm here, an L1 norm here, and, and of course, yeah, an L1 norm here and, and, and an L2 norm here. So these are very easy things, very, very kind of locally well known and just linear algebra. But uh, when, you, when you say, Misha, linear algebra, you mean like some kind of Fourier analysis? This is just uh, you, you write everything. In, they don't uh, even, you can do it. For, you can use Fourier analysis, but you don't yeah. even need Fourier analysis. So, so, so you can just give proofs which are which are pure linear algebra, mm -hmm. just just matrix, just eigenvalues of matrices. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, Ilya has a very sort of unified, so Ilya can prove anything using these methods and, and, and some proofs he does like are very, are, are, well, first of all, they're very beautiful. Secondly, very, very, quite, quite involved. But, but in a sense, it all boils down to, 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 to change in the basis, 
singular value decomposition or and uh, in, and and for this particular theorem just much easier much easier things like eigenvalues of, of Hermitian matrices right. okay so and now how does this theorem apply this theorem applies as follows so this is the number of isosceles triangles and I can think of it as the number of incidences between lines, so which are bisectors, and points. But lines are weighted by this by this quantity. And in my estimate, so so this is so now I'm just writing it down. So that T is. This is n, the number of points, p, the character, the size of the field, times uh, times the L1, so, so the sum of all n2s. Each pair of points is, is symmetric relative to some axis. So the sum of all n2s is n squared. So this is the first term, and now comes the second term, the square root of pn and the L2 norm of the weights. And the L2 norm of the waste is exactly the square root of my bisector energy. So this is the estimate for the bisector energy with the car term, K term. And again, I need to, so let's consider, so let's look at, let's suppose I can disregard this K, this term for now. So if I disregard this term, then I only have this main one, and I plug it in here, and then I basically get, so, so, so I get the dominance of this term in the estimate for t. And this term is, is really like a statistical term. So if this term dominates, life is good. So if this ter term dominates, it's not good. And it happens that this term dominates when uh, n is bigger than, when n is bigger than p to the five quarters. Provided that I drop this one. So this is uh, the algebra here, just uh, verifying this. Uh, and uh, then I need to look at the second term. So the second term is a bit of a problem. And actually, it took us several months to sort this, this second term out, unless we realized that, that sorting it out was, again, some very trivial uh, argument. So far, whenever I apply the point plane theorem, I've never been screwed up by this by this term. I suspect that if this term actually matters, then your application is there's something wrong with your application. And so this term bothered us for a while. So so if you do the main term, if you just leave the main term in the point plane estimate in the bisector energy estimate, plug it in here, and you get it just as you want. So that uh, basically that's when, uh, when uh, n, when the number of points is about p to the five quarters, you can disregard this term. And once you've disregarded this term, you're done. Because uh, t is uh, about n to the 15 quarters uh, minus one which is uh, which is uh, 15 quarters minus one is 11 quarters. So the number of distinct distances, distinct, the number of pin distance, I mean the number of pin distances is uh, oh, sorry, p to the 11 quarters is n cubed divided by t, which is, uh, uh, which is p. So what remains is to deal with this term. And again, if you do the algebra, it turns out that this term, that this term becomes dom So this term comes into play if k is bigger than p to the three quarters. And now we can just uh, 
look at this separate case. So it's a totally, totally different proof. So we're dealing basically with a putative set A, which has size P to the five quarters and roughly lies on the union of about square root of P pairs of concentric rich circles. I mean, this is real as to this picture is, uh, and each circle is very rich. So each circle has uh, at least this number of points. And then it just ends up, I mean, we really, we spend so much time doing this. We tried all sorts of fancy Fourier analysis, wild sums, whatnot, until we realized that this is just truly a trivial argument. You just count the number of, of uh, isosceles triangles that kick in by hand, just by drawing pictures. And essentially the only thing that you use here is that since you live in the plane over FP, there is only, there are at most P lines coming through a single point. That's really the only thing that this argument needs. And that was kind of the end of story. So we, uh, we could show that this putative set A exactly gives us again the same number of isosceles triangles as we want. And then we were done. I suppose I'm definitely not going to tell you about single distance bounds in three dimensions, so that's for next time. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Misha. We Great. can clap, I think. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a stupid one, um, if I may. So, Misha, yeah. I, I, I didn't uh, quite understand the intuition um, for... So, the fact that you, you after you apply the change of coordinates, if you take a segment, then the uh, space of the symmetric segments with respect to the line is actually the plane. So, if you take one-dimensional picture, so if you take a point and look at uh, the space, so you look at the sets of the points that are symmetric with respect to other points. So I, I'm, I'm just trying to do one, one dimensional. Uh, no, of, one dimensional point is, 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 this, is the whole plane, right? Because I mean, yes. any, any two points in the plane are symmetric. Right? Are symmetric with respect to, but uh, so why? Ah, I guess now I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, think about this. So these are two random segments of the same length in the plane. They're, they're not going to be actually symmetric relative to some axis. Sure, yeah. Because the space of segments is three-dimensional, but the space of axes is two-dimensional. Okay, no, I, I understood right now that the intuition, because I was confused why, why it doesn't work for points, uh, the, or rather it works for points, but it also gives the plane, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, just so in other words, basically axial symmetries, I mean, they are rigid motions, but they're kind of thin in the, in the overall set of rigid motions. They're very, I mean, they're very special. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Uh, yes. Are, are these bounds for the number of associate triangles uh, tight in some... Oh, no, 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 not at all, of course. I mean, so probably it's, I mean, it's n squared really for sufficiently small sets. But the problem is, so you see, all the Euclidean arguments about about the about the about pinned distances, they've used simulated rotor theorem. The simulated rotor theorem is is much stronger than the point plane theorem I use. So the simulated rotor theorem certainly implies uh, the point plane theorem. Moreover, actually, even the Beck theorem already implies the point plane theorem. So the point plane theorem is is is, is very weak in comparison. And, uh, and if you do a silly argument, so if you try to bound the number of distinct distances just by saying that simulated rotor theorem tells me that in the, in, in the Euclidean plane, that in the, Euclid in the Euclidean plane, a single distance cannot appear more than n to the four thirds times, which immediately implies that I have n to the two thirds distinct mm -hmm. distances. Mm -hmm. So, so this is kind of the level of, of, 
of uh, the claim that we're making. So we find a way to circumnavigate and somehow at least prove a reasonable exponent for the number of distinct spin distances, which is above n to the one half. So not to the n to the one half plus epsilon, but at least n to the two thirds. But that's the best we can do with things we know. Just uh, the fact that this Prunian procedure was very tight, and it gives the bound you wish nothing better, suggests that maybe it gives some construction, something like that. Mm, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I, I, I mean, I, I doubt, but no, I mean, I would say. No, so it that has to be. It, I mean, the, the number of isosceles triangles. I mean, but for some degenerate cases, if you throw out, if you, I mean, if you don't bother about these silly zero distances, I mean, you can always uh, just deal with uh, a p which is like which is congruent to to three mod four, so you don't have any isotropic lines. But I would, I would strongly believe that the true bound for a number of isosceles triangles is like n n n, n squared log n or something like this. Uh, Misha, oh, sorry, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I have one, another question. If uh, so, yes, this please. Uh, thank you. So this exponent five fourth in your proof. Uh, so and uh, your savage and defensive people on the side of uh, decoupling. So they, I mean, it looks like okay. You you mentioned uh, that there is decoupling, so that's probably proving some like restriction estimate for something. And, and on your side. It seems like the Fourier analytic part, which can be replaced, is this Wien theorem, which which that's where you would. So what what is the correspondence? What, why is that five five quarters in both? I have no idea. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, I I don't know. I guess this is. Uh, I mean, there, there must be. I mean, it's not. It's. I guess it's not accidental, but it's. But it's not accidental on some very sort of on some very sort of meta mathematical level i guess it's just as much as as the powers of we, what we can do go in some sense so with decoupling uh with decoupling there is yosage tells me there is no dream of improving their five quarters because their methods do not distinguish circles from parabola uh, and uh, and if you basically replace distances Euclidean distances by some kind of potato distances where potatoes like uh, consist of like two glued parabola and smooth them between each other. Then their five quarters is actually tight. So I don't know what I mean. I mean I don't know why we ended up having five quarters. Some some kind of weird weird accident in some sense because our our analysis is 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 completely for it's it, it's for analysis free so this this wing theory doesn't need for analysis yeah but i was thinking so maybe if you replace it with the Fourier analytic proof you will get uh, uh some but it's it's actually not five probably not what what gives you I, I thought that there is a direct correspondence maybe if you prove one of your claims using Fourier analysis then there would be direct correspondence to some uh, decoupling. Ah, uh, no, no, but this this for analysis of finite fields is yeah. just so baby. It's some some kind. I mean, I mean, really, it's, it's so so for analysis. I mean, the, the, you can you can use the clay, you can prove with Vink's claim using for analysis. But this for analysis will be really you can just view it as as a, as a change of basis and. Yeah, it's a Gauss sum. I, I understood it right now. It's a, it's a very indeed. It, you know, this 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 Vink proof doesn't even use Gauss sums. Yeah, maybe even simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, I have also, Misha, one, one general question about so the the relationship between this uh, finite field statements and this Haudorf dimension statements in uh, for you for you is like this Kakea problem or in this context, like was there any like uh, kind of in uh, exchange in terms of methods or uh, in any sense between this kind of uh, between this these problems like in, in the case of this one or in the case of kakea or in the in any other and no case i would say 
Uh, but, but you know how it went, right? So, so I mean, first there was an exchange when when finite fields sort of became fashionable, and uh, and then people were dragging the methods they had developed for for the Euclidean methods into finite fields, and and say about restriction, there was this long paper by Mockenhaupt and Tower that people quote all over, but then. Basically, it was a red herring because then Dvir just proved the Kakea by the polynomial method so elegantly. Uh, and, and, and did it, did it in the other direction? Nothing, nothing went in the other direction, kind uh, of. Or? I think Larry Guth is probably, I mean, Guth and his, and, and his, and his surroundings. So they, they do manage to pull some of the polynomial partitioning ideas into, into say, restriction. And they, they get the improve, I mean, they get the improvements. But but technically, of course, things become very difficult there because because you have to because things at small angles kind of so as soon as you thicken all these things, I mean things at small angles they start looking the same like like you know like like the usual thing that two tubes I mean which are at a very small angle to to each other have a gigantic intersection in terms of the number of atoms if if, if the whole space has space has been split into atoms so there is some but uh, but not 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 much I mean. Even with incidence theorem, so, so you know, like there is an analog of similarity trotter. Uh, if you thicken lines into tubes and points into atoms, but only provided that that either the set of lines in the parameter space or the set of points is kind of well distributed, so it looks a little bit, looks like sort of a shaken grid. In some sense, so like some kind of Delaunay set or some. Other than that, um, there are just examples showing that no. So so so. Other than that, it's it's just so complicated. Right? So there is very little sort of interaction between between these. I mean, of course, Larry Guth can do miracles. So so. so <laughs> I mean, uh, so. so. <laughs> Okay, so if no other questions, let's thank the speaker again. Very interesting talk. Thanks a lot, Misha. Very nice.